10, Scrap Baby. Scrap Baby is a creepy animatronic. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Scrap Baby is by far creepier than the normal baby animatronic, and this costume certainly does it justice. Animatronics are a difficult costume to really make, since we're people, and unfortunately do not have robotic limbs for the most part. Or if we do, we typically try to make it look like a real leg instead of a robot leg. But a Scrap Baby is even more difficult since, you know, it's a scrap animatronic, and it has a giant freaking claw in its hand. Scrap Baby is a very damaged and recycled version of Baby with a realistic reddish orange kind of bodysuit, light blue stuff, pig yellow pigtails and okay, she wears on she wears an orange top with red ferrules and it's just super damaged, okay? Like this she's very damaged. <laughs> Mentally and physically. Yet somehow Instagram user Gaius Bazani was able to recreate this in an awesome way. So, very well done. In an eye spring trap. Craftix Gaming's YouTube channel features a video of a real spring trap costume, and honestly, it's terrifying. Spring trap is the main animatronic of FNAF 3, and this costume is freaking nuts. This is a very good costume, and while spring trap may not be the scariest animatronic, he's not someone I'm gonna want to tussle with. However, I wanna talk about what's going on with this character because my guy. You dressed up as a possessed man who is inhabiting an animatronic, unable to die but still decaying. You are quite literally dressing up as a serial killer. Like in, in the FNAF world, if you dressed up like this, it would be like if you dressed up as Ted Bundy in this world. And if you want to be in FNAF that badly, okay, don't dress as the serial killer is all I'm saying. And I know that's ironic coming from me. Okay, given what I'm dressed like at this moment, do I look like I want to be in Five Nights at Freddy's? Have I made things seem like I want to be in this world? Because if I have, you need to watch more of these videos, okay? Also, I'm dressed up as the, the purple guy who makes no appearance in the actual FNAF world, okay? There is no actual, I mean, okay, there is the actual purple guy, but he doesn't look like this, okay? The purple guy that I am dressed as is not actually a, a real version of the serial killer in their world, okay? I don't want to be in that world. Those doors aren't it, Chief. They ain't it. No, the doors ruin it for me. And it ain't entered. Costumes don't really have to be elaborate to be scary. Take, for example, this entered cosplay by YouTube channel Skywarped33. The entire endoskeleton spaghetti bits aren't there, but the lights and sounds make it even more frightening than you'd think. The face also opens up, and I think that we all know how I feel about animatronics who can move their face at will at this point, okay? It's not something that should be allowed. However, even without all the parts and the eyes, this entered cosplay is not something I would want to run into in a dark alley, especially not after that goddamn vent repair mini game that caused me to have some serious issues okay I, I it it's rough okay I used to like spaghetti man like now what a, now what am I supposed to do and it's evident Vanny with Vanny being an upcoming villain and already one of the most popular characters in the series there are bound to be plenty of costumes of her however this one from Rogito Uwu on Twitter is probably the most accurate and creepiest one I've seen Vanny being a reluctant follower does in a way technically make this a glitch trap cosplay as well but we won't really talk about that because that's not what counts this costume is probably the most realistic costume on this list because well Vanny in the games ended up making her own suit and is just a human inside, whereas like the other characters like Scrap Baby or Spring Chop are animatronics as well as mm, sometimes part human, be it soul or another body. And Rogito's costume follows the exact same concept as Vanny, just a person who makes their own suit, which makes this potentially one of the scariest things of all. I mean, technically it's not the same thing because they're not possessed and enticed to make it by the person possessing their brain, but, I mean, it's close enough. I mean, they could be possessed for all we know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's six, Nightmare Freddy. Nightmare Freddy is one of the most iconic versions of the character, even if there are only three games that feature this guy, those being FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Knife, and FNAF VR. However, this Nightmare Freddy cosplay is insane, and in my opinion, would have been our frontrunner for the Coupe de France cosplay competition that it was for back in 2017. The video was uploaded by YouTube channel Gorgon Geek, and this guy plays the robot thing really well. But as soon as he drops that microphone, he goes into terror mode, and it's certainly something to behold. I would have enjoyed it if he had like the little Freddles with him, but the moving mouth is certainly a nice touch, especially with the attempted jump scares they do in the video, because he just goes like, ah, and stuff. Like, imagine if this guy had started twerking, though. <laughs> At one point, I thought he was going to. He went to pick up the mic, and I thought he was just going to start busting it, but no. I think that would have won them gold, though. If you, if you get this out of here. If you had started twerking, my guy, you would have won. I don't know what place you came in, but 
if you had twerked, you would have won. Halfway through into number five, Buff Helpy. Okay. This may not be a cosplay, but Buff Helpy is probably the most disturbing non-cosplay character I can really include on this list. If you didn't already know, Buff Helpy is a meme that was created on a Daco FNAF meme review video and has ever since been haunting him and the rest of the community. Don't get me wrong, okay? I love Helpy. But this Buff Helpy meme has generated a whole load of Buff FNAF character ideas and it terrifies me now. There's no, nowhere is safe from these creations. If you look up any character, you're bound to find a buff version of them at some point. You just need to scroll down enough, okay? It's, it's just, it's one of the rules of the internet, okay? Same thing with what happens to Chica. But no matter what, this is just some psychological torment that I wish, I, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, actually. But I, I'm talking about it because, like, it's Halloween, and the world is currently my worst enemy, so if I have to look at this thing on a regular basis when I'm writing these goddamn lists, you have to look at it for this one number, okay? One number, that's all I ask. And at four, Nightmare. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Nightmare is the scariest animatronic from the games, hands down. This guy will get me every time, and it's one of those reasons I just refuse to play FNAF 4. The other is Nightmare Fredbear, but at least I don't have to deal with them in real life, right? They're only a nightmare character created in the mind of a coma patient in a video game, right? Well, guess again. Huh. Thanks to Zom Bunny Creations on Amino Apps, we get both Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear. Ironically, Nightmare Fredbear is played by their twin sister. And I mean, it's ironic because, well, Elizabeth Afton is sometimes presumed to be Crying Child's twin sister. Anyway, these absolute hulking costumes are going to make me drop a load of my pants. Like, if I saw this in real life, holy crap! Like, uh, imagine actually living in a house that is at least kind of laid out like the one from FNAF 4. And then your, your kids want to play a prank on you. My grandparents' house is kind of laid out like this. It's not, it's not as simple as just two halls on either side of the room, but like they have a their the master bedroom does have two doors. So theoretically, that's something that can be reenacted there. I don't want to do that. No. Getting close to the end in at number three, Glitch Trap. We know my issue with Glitch Trap, all right, okay? We know that I just wanna watch William Apton burn and then leave him there permanently, hence why I'm wearing the costume. But I want him to, like, I want him to actually be in hell and then stay there while we move on with another killer or something else in the series, please, for God's sake, Scott. I hate this always comes back thing that he's got going on. And despite being dressed as purple guy, I want William dead. So, when I saw this frighteningly realistic looking glitch trap costume, my nerves hit an all time high. I think the sheer simplicity of the glitch trap suit is certainly something that makes this a creepy costume since the stitches are very accentuated here. They're very clear on this version. Like, it might be like the higher contrast than like the actual suit in the games, because like you can you know that they're there, but you can't really tell. But like, either way, this is creepy. Plus, again, it's another version of William Goddamn Afton who already haunts my nightmares. So what the heck, Zombunny Creations? Again, on Twitter this time. Why do you got to do this to me, huh? Why, bro? And ultimately, in at number two, Twisted Freddy. Holy ever living hell, okay? This is a horrific masterpiece that I could only hope to achieve. This full body Twisted Freddy costume is probably one of the most horrific FNAF costumes I've ever seen. Especially because I believe that the Twisted animatronics are probably the scariest version of the animatronics present in the novels, and a solid tie for the scariest animatronics alongside the nightmare ones from FNAF 4. This is some pretty damn expert craftsmanship if you ask ask me though, okay? This is a full body suit and it blows my freaking mind. Like look at this. It would weigh a ton and it would definitely need a hander, especially if my clumsy ass was the one walking around in it, but it straight up looks like if Freddy Krueger were an animatronic. And I mean, I'm not mad about it in the slightest, but like it's still freaking creepy. So well done to regular sauce, who is the Twitter user behind this glorious creation. Well done. And finally, in a number one, Withered Bonnie. This Withered Bonnie cosplay is probably the scariest damn FNAF cosplay I've ever seen. This is incredible and comes from the YouTube user The Nick of Time. At first, I legitimately thought that this was CGI instead of an actual costume, but lo and behold, it was just an insane costume. Glowing eyes and seemingly actually aluminum parts, and a chest that opens up that you can push it out with your other hand, which is honestly 
actually a, a decent scare. And frankly, in the video, I was kind of taken aback when they did that. So in real life, I'm sure that it was result in at least a bit of a jump scare. But this kind of thing always impresses the hell out of me. Because like the closest I've come to making a full costume was when I helped someone work on one of theirs. But that's the closest I've gotten. Hey, I made like a lightning bolt for the chest. And I, I, I helped, I made paper cup, like bracers, that's about it. This is hella impressive to me. I don't understand how people do this. In a 10666 custom night. In the good old days where all we figured was that we were uh, criminals stuck in purgatory, we thought that all the secrets of FNAF could be solved using the game's custom night, where you'd set the animatronics to a specific level and see if you can make it through. However, one such suggestion, the 666 suggestion, was in fact not the case. By setting the latter three animatronics to level 6, it was rumored that the kitchen camera would be unlocked and you'd have audio as well as visual this time around. But that just turns out to simply not be the case because, well, if you look at the game files, there is no visual for the kitchen cam at all. Meaning that no matter what, unless you added a version of it yourself, there would be no way to unlock that camera. And this wasn't the only time we'd be getting trolled by FNAF 1's custom night, but more on that whole kerfuffle later on, maybe. Fun fact though, kerfuffle is what I named my first club penguin puffle. And at 9, Tater the Waiter Gator. Tater the Waiter Gator was a fan made character that was made just for fun. However, a fake Scott that also did a whole other fake FNAF thing took the model to Twitter, claiming that they were a new animatronic. This guy was a real menace back in the day. And while it was indeed a joke, the appearance of an alligator face in FNAF 3's Happiest Day minigame made people reconsider the canonicity of Tater the Waiter Gator. However, he isn't and was never canon, we think. With the alligator character mask being explained away with Montgomery Gator, who, luckily, is not a waiter. He's a golfer, and apparently an assassin. We better get to solve the whole did Monty kill Bonnie thing in like the DLC to Security Breach, or I'm gonna be mad and destroy my own green room. I mean, maybe I won't because I don't have a green room, but I'll definitely be disappointed with the quality of the FNAF DLC if it's not about solving Bonnie. I mean, like, there's a multiplayer mode mod, so you also might as well add that. Okay, it, it's... <laughs> Just do it. And it ain't Purple Guy Animatronic. The Purple Guy Animatronic legend is an urban legend revolving around 2014's Five Nights at Freddy's 2. In early 2015, a YouTube video surfaced that reportedly showed a hidden animatronic reported to be the Purple Guy. You know, the main antagonist of the franchise, William Afton, the man behind the slaughter, mother of dragons, breaker of chains. Well, the appearance of the Purple Animatronic was preceded by a phone ringing. After the phone rang, the Purple Animatronic briefly flashed on screen, slumped against the wall, all in a similar style to Golden Freddy. However, it was soon revealed that the animatronic was simply a photoshopped image of Golden Freddy with a purple color scheme and a purple cheek ahead, which I feel like it's pretty obvious that that's the case. I mean, if you just, if you look at it, you can tell. And I mean, like, we've used that a couple times, but I never believed it. Plus, if there was a purple guy animatronic, it wouldn't just be reused assets. What are you on about? But there could still be a secret purple animatronic that we don't know about, or maybe Toxic Springtrap in this this case is the key to everything. And it's 7, the 2i theory. The 2i theory states that in the bad ending to FNAF 3, there are two eyes lit up in the head in the back, which we assume is Golden Freddy to show that there are two souls inside the animatronic. This isn't the case at all, and I'm going to tell you why. Firstly, it would be more difficult to tell that it was an animatronic head if only one eye was lit up, since all we see of this head are the eyes. And it's just it's just a reflection from the first light. Since there's one light in the head, it kind of bounces around since it's so dark, okay? That's just kind of how light works. Notice how Freddy also has light coming out of his other eye. But there's no two souls in Freddy, right? Secondly, Crying Child hadn't been introduced yet, not coming until the next game that wasn't even going to happen until the community was disappointed with the Springtrap jump scare since this was supposed to be the end of the series. That's why we released the souls in the Happiest Day minigame. Also notice that only one person wears a Golden Freddy mask in that game. And according to the official Freddy Files updated edition book, quote, you'll see an image of broken animatronic heads, each with a lit eye. Meaning that the golden Freddy head in the back only has one eye that is on. Okay, and considering how this is the official guidebook to the series, we kind of need to take it as law. The only argument against this, it would be that Scott could have adapted the story after this, since in a Reddit post he said that he has only ever made one retcon, but didn't actually provide the retcon itself. So the intention between the two eyes could be the retcon, but given the Freddy Files book actually came out after, or at least the updated one did, 
Uh, I doubt it. And it's extreme theory. What is seen in the shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. Those words are from the developer of the series, Scott Cawthon himself, on his website during a Map Hat charity livestream where he says before, four games, one story. So what's going on? Players were scratching their heads for a long time about how this could be possible with one linear story, but like, how? And we came to one conclusion. Could it all be a dream? The online community at one point believed so. Apparently, uh, uh, because of FNAF 4, okay? It was, we, we thought that, that was a dream, therefore we thought everything else was going to be one long vivid dream after Crying Child got bit by an animatronic in 1983. Fans believe the bite played out a lot differently uh, than it actually did in the game series. So, does that mean that it originally was a dream and then Scott retconned it yet again and that was the one retcon? No idea. If that is the case though, is anything else in the series a dream? I don't know. Am I dreaming right now? I hope not. Is there really a dancing alligator dedicating a song to strippers and adult film stars? Yes, and that TikTok was very disturbing. Halfway through into number five, Sparky the dog. It sounds cute at first, but don't let that name fool you, okay? He's he's haunting to look at. He's an animatronic, of course, but um not a real one. <laughs> in the early days of development, a rumor began to spread around, apparently reporting a sixth animatronic that would make an appearance in the game. So if Sparky did appear, it would have been pretty obvious, because um, he's a dog, and that's literally the only dog in the game. But the good news is that he wasn't real. But if he was, apparently he wasn't going to attack you. He was just going to stand and, and watch you for a bit, which is kind of worse. Screenshots, of course, hit the internet, um, but it, it was never a thing. I, I don't know why people think that this is- people still like message me going like why haven't you made a list about Sparky the dog because he's not real It's not a thing, okay? Uh, like what and, and then there was a, the fake Scott that was saying that Sparky was there the whole time or like I wouldn't doubt it if Scott added him in a later game and was like no no, no Sparky's been a character this whole time What are you talking about cuz like Scott is the ultimate gaslighter? Okay, he's the ultimate gaslighter, but he makes it clear when he is gaslighting you So at least you don't think that you're actually crazy. It's very clear when he's doing it But he still loves to do it getting close to the end of number three mrs. Afton's death the story of Mrs. Afton, if there even is one, is a mystery that we've been debating for ages. A story that hasn't even had a slight amount of explanation. No references, no mention of a name, nada. So, naturally, there are theories. However, these theories have no base in actual game lore, and instead focus on FNAF fan animated music videos and stories that are treated as canon, and sadly, heavily so, sometimes. The truth is that we have no idea what actually happened to Mrs. Afton currently. We have no idea if there even was a Mrs. Afton, or if it was just a baby mama, or if William ended up having a surrogate so he could have children of his own, and hell, his kids may just be adopted, or actually, Stolen. Yikes. Or maybe he used the ball pit from Into the Pit and went back in time and got kids from like 1920, which is also possible because FNAF made time travel a thing. Either way, for some reason, and I don't, and I'm not quite sure what video caused this to pick up, I'm pretty sure it was the Living Tombstones, a lot of people think that Mrs. Afton died in a car accident. I mean, it, it's a possibility, but that doesn't mean that it is canon. There are other explanations, and no one really says those are canon, so I don't know why you think that a car accident is canon. There are also others that think that William killed her, or that she just left him because she found out what he was doing, but then for some reason left his prime demographic with him, and didn't call the cops, and others think that her leaving is the reason that he started killing people. And you know what? All are equally possible, but nothing is actually canon, so stop it. But ultimately, in at number two, Gregory is 40. <laughs> To be totally honest, the knowledge that Gregory has in Security Breach exceeds that of my own, okay? This kid is the size of a four-year-old, can fit inside Freddy, can fit inside baby strollers and other various small areas around the Pizzaplex. He's too small to drive one of the go-karts alone, but he also knows how to restart generators, operate a trash compactor, start and is capable of driving a car, as well as identifying a car battery, connecting the jumper cables on a car battery properly, and then using those to fix Freddy's whole recharge every hour issue. Okay, even I can't drive a car. I don't have my, my full license. How is this kid doing it? I don't even know what how, what is this thing? Like, how in the living hell does this make any sense? How do they solve the whole recharge issue in the true ending? Because Freddy is still going to need to recharge every hour. 
and then, but they don't have the van this time because they ran out from a cave. So how do Freddy and Gregory make it down the hill or to whatever hill it is without Freddy needing to recharge? Or like, do they actually solve the issue? Uh, this kid knows more words than I do, but is still somehow the size of a four-year-old, maybe, on like the shortest end of the spectrum. Like, no, it, it makes no sense. And this kid's weird superpower is what makes this game so confusing. It really only makes sense if he was a robot that is supposed to mimic a toddler who's been on for decades and then has been learning the whole time. That's the only thing that makes sense, and that's saying something. And finally, in at number one, the Arcade Conspiracy. The Arcade Conspiracy gets its name from one of the lore duffel bags we can find around the Pizzaplex where we learn that something else seems to be going on here. Quote from this Arcade Conspiracy note, Quote, exit interview. They are working together, the arcades. They're hiding something, the glitches. Glitch them all at the same time. Then the princess will recognize me. She's testing me. I am not yet worthy. The others are protecting it. Let me stay, I'm so close. Just one more night, please. I can save the princess. Now it's clear that this seems to be referring to the Princess Quest minigames. However, it doesn't really seem like we have to glitch the Princess Quest games in order to win. We just have to beat them in orders from one to three and then boom, we save Vanny. So what does this actually actually mean. Well, there are three other arcade machines that seem to be having mysterious glitches as well. The Balloon Boy World game you can find in the theater in uh, the sun drops weird room thing. Cheek is feeding frenzy which won't turn off even when you unplug it that you're supposed to be able to find in the bakery. And the Monty Golf AR Arcade that according to its duffel bag shouldn't be in the mini golf area but it is. However, while you can play both Balloon Boy World and the Monty Golf game, my lowest score is 14 and the lowest score you can get is 13 so try to beat that. But Chica's Feeding Frenzy isn't an arcade cabinet. You can only access it using a mod that lets you cheat it in from the main menu. So maybe there is something else going on that we just uh, can't access yet because the game was released unfinished and still cost 50 damn dollars. And a 10, Ness. With the interviews and therapy sessions we get in Security Breach, we got even more information and even more clues on the story of the previous three FNAF games. Well, okay, two main series games and then one spin-off. Yes, that's right. These therapy sessions actually ended up confirming our suspicions that Vanessa was indeed the Ness from FNAF AR. So with this revelation, we now know that in FNAF VR we played as Vanessa, who was probably put there by someone higher up at Fazbear Entertainment because they knew what Athen was planning or maybe someone hacked. That's a whole separate thing. We got possessed and then we got our mind locked away. And then we got sent to the special delivery section to install our virus on various animatronics as maybe a test run. And then we moved to head security guard for the Pizzaplex, which is where Security Breach starts. So thanks to the simple mention of Lewis and her looking up odd things at work along with her secret encrypted conversations, we know the full story of Vanessa since FNAF ER. And at 9 Purgatory. Back when FNAF first released, Matt Pat came to the conclusion that in this game we were the killer. The man who killed the missing children and caused all of this to really happen. But that we were also trapped in purgatory for our crimes and that this game was our punishment for said crimes. And while at the time he was incorrect, Scott must have been listening. Since eventually, seven games, six books, multiple promos, and unlimited tears later, he made this the premise of the game in Ultimate Custom Night. Later it would seemingly be retconned into a dream that William has, either while he's recharging his burn trap or while he's stuck in Vanny or something. But nevertheless, Matt Pat was indeed eventually correct. I mean, we, we kind of have to take this as a win because despite it being for the wrong game, it did eventually turn out to be pretty true. All right, it, that's insane when you think about it. In a purple guy identity. Before Sister Location's release, we could only speculate as to the name of the individual we knew as Springtrap and the purple guy. Tons of names were made with Dave being the most popular and the one generally accepted, even now, kind of. However, the true purple guy name reveal of William Afton started in the FNAF novels, specifically the first novel in the actual novel series, The Silver Eyes. This was shown to those of us who didn't actually want to read the book by MatPat, because you know what, most people called the book cringe. But in his theory on the subject, he actually kind of agreed. <laughs> a lot of people were actually glad we finally had at least some form of canon name for the characters, and then others were mad because he had used the books for a theory which don't share the same continuity as the games, despite sharing the same canon of Five Nights at Freddy's. This theory, however, was ultimately confirmed to be true during Sister Location's starting scene, when we first hear Afton speak. Well, actually, it wasn't by him, it was by the person he was talking to, which I'm assuming is like an FBI agent or some form of police officer. He was talking about Baby's various features, which is how we also found out 
out that she has more to her than uh, meets the color changing eyes. And it's Seven Cassidy. Since the beginning of FNAF, we have been wondering about the mysterious and seemingly supernatural entity of Golden Freddy. The entity able to travel through solid doors and walls. Who gave us hallucinations and crashed our game when they got to us? Who was this mysterious being? Over the years, we got a few names, most notably with the gravestone ending in FNAF 6. But even with that, Golden Freddy's name had always eluded us. And if they are the one you should not have killed, or if they aren't, the name wasn't given to us in Ultimate Custom Night either. Only an alias. But alas, we were saved when the FNAF Survival Logbook came out. Yet another FNAF book. Where after jumping through more hoops than dogs at a dog show or dolphins at SeaWorld, we uncovered the name Cassidy. Thanks to wrong numbers on various pages becoming coordinates in the word search of all things. It was a lot for a name revealed that honestly didn't really mean much to the series since the name Cassidy only appears in one other place, that being the final novel of the original trilogy, The Fourth Closet, and the ultimately scrapped Cassidy movie script, but since it was scrapped, the character is of little consequence otherwise, which, uh, which sucks. And it's six, Puppet's Origins. The security puppet minigame was something that was quite the mystery to a few FNAF fans, since, well, if Charlotte was killed outside the restaurant, how was the puppet able to get possessed? Since we now know, we typically have to be in the vicinity of the object that we're possessing. This was explained to us in the security puppet minigame from FNAF 6, where we see the puppet crawl out to Charlotte in the rain after William is driven off. This was a simple yet much needed explanation, at least to me, since it was very confusing how the laws of what's possible seemingly change with the individual. But with that simple scene, we understood the whole story. How a loving father was scared for his daughter's safety, how she was in danger thanks to William, so in an effort to protect her, Henry developed a green wristband that had a specific coding on it. This code released a signal that the puppet animatronic would prioritize in case anything happened. Then, while stuck outside, William struck, which set off the bracelet alerting the puppet, who, in a last ditch attempt to save her, crawled out in the rain and merged with Charlotte. A sad, but evidently required story. Halfway through into number 5, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1990, in 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, the manager, is tallying receipts in a back room. While she does that, Bobby Stevens scrubs down the kitchen, and Sylvia Crawwell, Ben Grant, and Colleen O'Connor all work in the main cleaning party area. However, there is someone secretly hiding in the bathroom, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap. Earlier that year, he had began working as a cook before getting into an argument over his hours, which resulted in him losing his job. But this time, he wasn't looking for his job back, he was looking for revenge. He exited the bathroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen, and then he went into the kitchen where the bullet entered Bobby's jaw and sent him flying to the ground. Then he went into the back where Margaret opened the safe before being sh** twice. Nathan then filled her bag with $1,500 cash, arcade tokens, and keychains, but thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. This was originally pointed out to us by Game Theory and Map Hat because it's actually kind of crazy how close these stories are. And while it may not be true that it was inspired by this, I still think that these stories are so close it's impossible not to think about. While the inspiration may not be true, the connection, even if accidental, certainly is. Getting close to the end in number four, We're the Killer. Well, yes, I did start playing through FNAF Beyond the channel. Be sure you go watch that and share and like it. If you want more, I'm not gonna be doing more. <laughs> I already know the end of the game. No matter what you do in the final battle against Glitchtrap, you end up getting stuck in the game while he gets out. And while maybe it's signifying that he's taking over your body or escaping from the game, what if instead he was passing the baton to you? I mean, I've already said it, right? It looks like he was taking over your body like physically controlling it when you're not in the game. Yeah, that would mean that you were the new killer. But what if you were trapped in the game instead, and instead it drove you insane, until you do the same thing and switch with some unfortunate soul who ends up playing again, turning them into the code while you, as yourself, escape and then try to track down the man who took your life. I mean, if the game really was meant to be a soft reboot, wouldn't you becoming the killer really be the ultimate switch up? Well, not exactly. It was mostly Right, okay, Glitchtrap did possess us and we did become the killer of the next game since we play as Vanessa in that game, confirmed in the therapist recordings in Security Breach, but we don't go track down William or we don't turn other people into code, we merely just get locked away and then after, went after his own body, but I mean, hey, either way, we were still the killer. Getting close to the end in number three, first animatronics. We always figured that the FNAF 1 animatronics were the first ones made after the Springlock versions of Bonnie and Freddy, but that was always just an assumption. But then, the fast facts came in with the truth 
and dropped us some purebred apple of knowledge right at our feet. One of the fast facts stated from FNAF AR says, quote, Some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured claw mechanisms that were able to hide away items inside. Which means that, strangely enough, the Funtime animatronics were the first ones that Afton made. I'm guessing after the spring lock suits, which then solidified what we at least thought was the timeline at the time. Which, it does make other things more confusing, but at least we knew which ones are the closest to being made first without really having to speculate. And then that puts sister location near the start of the timeline. It doesn't mean that they were the actual like first first animatronics, only that they were made around the beginning, but it shows us that William also always had sinister intentions. It's something that a lot of people need to know. But ultimately, in a number two, Happiest Day Masks. FNAF 3's Happiest Day minigame was the final minigame required to get the good ending. The ending where the animatronics had no lights on in their heads and the spirits had been put to rest. But there was always something out of place that we didn't really mention at the beginning because we didn't really want to deal with it, but there are multiple characters wearing masks from animatronics we had never seen before. But why and how? Where did these masks of alligators, pigs, hippos, and elephants come from? Well, now we actually know. It was the mediocre melodies introduced into FNAF 6, and then the alligator ends up being Montgomery Gator from Security Breach. Because while it is a green mask, okay, a frog doesn't have a snout, <laughs> okay? Which makes me think, when does that really take place? Although at this point, I don't think we can really pinpoint that. Maybe Monty has been around for a while and he just became more popular for Security Breach. After all, the other animatronics kind of got a bad rep, you know? Who knows? These animatronics may have existed for all of time, but we actually did think that there were more animatronics, and now we know we were right. And finally, in a number one, Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is a fictional character created by Thomas Harris. Lecter is a serial killer who then his victims, if you know what I'm saying. I feel like it's pretty obvious and I can't really say the word, but you know what I mean. Before his capture, he was actually a respected forensic psychiatrist, but after his incarceration, he's consulted by FBI agents Will Graham and Clarice Starling to help them find other serial killers, which is a whole other problem. His most iconic appearance is in Silence of the Lambs and the often misquoted line of, hello Clarice, or have the lambs stopped screaming. And while you may not really see any similarities between Afton and Lecter, we did seem to think that there were some. I mean, this dude's an absolute psycho. And you know what? This was confirmed as inspiration for his voice. According to his voice actor PJ Haywood in Sister Location, Afton's voice actually was inspired by Hannibal Lecter in a way that like he's seemingly extremely calm even when he's about to kill someone, which is supported by some of his novel counterparts quotes. So yeah, while it's not exactly directly inspiring Afton, it inspired his voice. And and if he had to add the fact that he's like, oh yeah, he's unnervingly calm, even when he's about to kill someone, does that mean that whoever was interviewing Afton is, uh, dead? In a 10, Afton possessed. A long time ago, I made a passing comment that Afton wasn't actually dead. People were mad that I didn't put Springtrap on the original scariest animatronics list, and aside from him being literally so unscary that they had to make a whole new game to compensate, I also argued that since he's just a guy enhanced by robotics, he wasn't an animatronic and instead a cyborg. And in the great terms of Fallout 4, nobody liked that. Even when I cited the fact that even Matt Pat pointed out that Springtrap never dies. But that's aside the point. However, I was in fact proven correct when the story of the man in room 1280 came around to show us that William was unable to die thanks to the spirit of the one you should not have killed. A young boy with an alligator mask in the books who was keeping him alive so that he could suffer for his crimes. And until this day, most people still won't accept that despite it being proven, okay? They take him off life support in the book and he's still kicking after that, okay? So whether this hospital experience actually happens or not, the point of the book was to show us that Afton was possessed and that's how he survived, okay? Someone needs to update the wikis, cause they still say that he died as a human. He didn't really die until like the FNAF 6 fire maybe when he became a sentient code if we want to consider that dying. In at 9, the golden killer. I am absolutely positive that the FNAF universe has plenty of urban legends about these restaurants. I mean, like, how could they not? A place where kids keep going missing that then gets shut down and reopens almost every five years? If that's not a cause for urban legends, I don't know what is. Christ, this is one of the most horrifying stories a parent could ever hear about. Like, if anyone so much just looked at in our direction wrong as a kid, my father would ban us from returning. It, it was insane, and I'm honestly surprised that he didn't 
me. Either way, there must be tales of the golden killer that would dress in an animatronic suit and lure children away with the promise of free tickets and pizza. Obviously used as a cautionary tale by parents about the dangers of talking to strangers, but I think they may not realize how close and how serious these stories actually are. Especially given that the Pizza Plex, at least when it's open, is still packed full of children despite nine kids already going missing there. And it ate Springtrap, another urban legend from the FNAF universe that's also in the FNAF universe, like it's from the FNAF universe but also inside the FNAF universe, is Springtrap. The whole point of Springtrap was that he was an old animatronic that still worked that they set loose in the Fazbear Fright horror attraction. The attraction that was a replica of the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizza located inside an actual amusement park meant to revive the decades old urban legends that surrounded the establishment from 30 years ago. Springtrap's whole purpose was to be an urban legend. If we got to see more from like the actual universe Universe, like materials and newspapers, I'm sure that they would have marketed the only working animatronic as horrifying and actually possessed by one of the original victims. All while being unaware that it was actually the killer that they had set loose once more. From a story standpoint, I see why they had to do it like this. It actually like puts stakes back into the series because the killer's out again. But my real question is why did Henry sell the location, okay? I mean like, they bought the place to get scraps, right? So why did Henry sell it if he was just planning on burning it down? Like, why risk William getting loose? Why even burn it down when he was already trapped in the room and had been stuck in there for 30 years, okay? Seems painfully stupid in my opinion. Dude, you don't need to sell it, okay? Just let him suffer. And at 7, Afton possessed. See how I changed the inflection? This time I put the emphasis on Afton instead of possessed. That's because this time around, Afton is the one doing the possessing instead of the one being possessed. Yes, we originally assumed that Vanny was going to be possessed by Glitchtrap, aka William Afton, aka the coded digital version of Afton's consciousness that possessed a VR video game. Yeah. Yeah, but it definitely wasn't something that could be proven at the time. But after the release of FNAF Security Breach and the discovery of the therapist tapes at the end, we know that this theory was in fact correct. Vanessa did get possessed by Glitchtrap at the end of FNAF VR, and then Afton used her to get back to his old body. However, now it seems that both versions of Afton are kicking around, assuming that the blob didn't destroy Burn Trap, something which we also still don't know, and probably won't know until the DLC comes out, or even maybe the next game, or maybe even a book. Hell, maybe even the movie! And it's 666 Custom Night. In the good old days where all we figured was that we were a criminal stuck in purgatory, we thought that all the secrets of FNAF could be solved using the game's Custom Night, where you'd set the different characters to specific difficulty levels, and then you'd see if you can make it through. However, one such suggestion, the 666 suggestion, was in fact not the case. By setting the latter three animatronics to level 6, it was rumored that the kitchen camera would be unlocked, and then you'd have audio as well as visual for this night. But uh, that turned out to to just simply not be the case because well if you look at the game files there is no visual for the kitchen camera meaning that no matter what unless you added a version of it yourself there would be no way to unlock that camera and this wasn't the only time we'd end up getting trolled by FNAF 1 custom night since later on the custom night having the code would indeed become true however that code was 1987 and it would just jump scare you instantly with Golden Freddy which is literally the worst thing ever. Halfway through into number five John Wayne Gacy. Clowns Springtrap is Springtrap's third skin in FNAF AR and the third skin to be introduced in the Dark Circus event. In addition to looking like a horrifying clown, he carries around a very large red mallet in his left hand. And considering how clowns are one of the most f common fears in the world, with more people in the states being scared of clowns than global warming, or even terrorism I think, I think putting Clown Springtrap on this list um, is definitely understandable because, you know, John Wayne Gacy. This man, okay, he's like Harley Quinn, but not cute, and basically still meant to be a reference to John Wayne Gacy, at least as I understand it. John Wayne Gacy being a serial killer who used to do kids shows dressed as either Pogo or Patches the Clown. An inspiration that was assumed but not confirmed seemingly until this skin. It's also worth noting that this skin looks a lot like the supernatural version of John Wayne Gacy's ghost, so I feel like that's where the connection comes from. Plus, you know, a clown killer. In it for FNAF Remake. For a while, we'd heard rumors of a FNAF remake. One that would be so utterly terrifying that we would forget all about the horrific implications it would have to the lore. But honestly, it was just that. Theories, rumors, speculation, 
legend. Until the announcement of the Fazbear Fanverse initiative. In that announcement we were indeed proven, at least somewhat correct, with the lineup containing FNAF Plus, a reimagining of the first Freddy Fazbear game being created by Fiznom, the creator of A Shadow Over Freddy's, Pork Chops Adventure, and a major contributor to the original Pop Goes fan game. Originally, Fiznom was creating a remake of FNAF 2 known as Five Nights at Freddy's 2 Open Source, later renamed to another FNAF fan game, Open Source, as practice for learning a new game engine. But since the game wasn't really a transformative remake of the original FNAF 2, Scott Cawthon did take the game down, because it was literally basically just FNAF 2. However, he was intrigued with the project and contacted Fiznom about making a original FNAF 1 remake, which uh, now he is. Getting close to the end of number 3, Bunny Man's Urban Legend. Okay, so you know, I play video games to disconnect from reality, I'm sure some of you do too. When I play like super hot in BR, I know that I, can, I can't really do it in real life because I uh, can't catch guns, but I can slow down time. But when scary games like FNAF are all of a sudden connected to real life horrible events, it's not really all that easy to play, and you know what? I hardly played them to begin with. <laughs> Vanny is a follower of Glitchtrap, okay? You know that. She's the main villain of Security Breach, but players notice something similar about the game's antagonist. Something connected to something very real from the 70s, the Bunny Man. In Fairfax County, Virginia, back in the late 70s, residents would report sightings of a Bunny Man, who would run around and terrorize locals. They say the Bunny Man disappeared in the early 80s, uh, but maybe they just disguised themselves as an animatronic, okay? Maybe the Bunny Man's still out there. You thought that Easter was a good idea? Ha! No, not anymore. Good luck sleeping tonight. Plus, I mean, Security Breach is, does have a very 80s aesthetic, so maybe this is where Bunny Man went. But ultimately, in number two, the missing children's incident. The missing children's incident was an event that occurred in the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location, at least from the first game, presumably in 1985, a series of unsolved murders committed by William Afton. In the first game, the incident was mentioned in newspaper clippings, occasionally seen replacing the rules for safety sign, normally appearing in the East Hall. The four mascots, Freddy Fazbear, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, all also had particularly foul odors and what appeared to be blood and mucus around their eyes and mouth, which concerned parents and legal guardians and decided to akin to reanimated carcasses since they quote notice what appeared to be blood and mucus around the eyes and mouths of the mascots and they didn't check inside them for bodies. The children were never found somehow and presumed dead and the restaurant ended up closing by year's end which didn't stop them from reopening in Fazbear's Fright and then with FNAF 6 and then again with the Pizzaplex. So yeah, needless to say there's a whole load of issues surrounding the brains of the parents in this universe. And finally, in a number one, the Bite of 87. Was that the Bite of 87? No, Markiplier, it was not. The Bite from FNAF 4 was in 1983 and often called the Chop or the Bite of 83. Okay, the Bite of 87 was an incident that occurred in 1987 at the second Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location. It was briefly mentioned by Phone Guy in the first game and it had us hooked from the get go. The details of this attack and the identity of the animatronic responsible are really unknown, but it allegedly caused the victim to lose their frontal lobe, you know, the front part of their brain. The victim actually ended up surviving the attack, but the incident contributed to a loss in the company's reputation, understandably, which was one of the numerous incidents that resulted in a major drop in business. But not forever, for some reason. As a result of the incident, the animatronics were no longer allowed to wander around during the day, uh, and instead management decided to let their free roaming mode be exclusive to night, so as to prevent their servos from locking up, uh, which is not how servos work, but maybe it's how they work in this universe. Some Fans think that Foxy caused the bite, others think Freddy, Mangle, some even think that Sheikah might have done it. However, it's pretty generally accepted that Jeremy from FNAF 2 is the one who got bit. But I propose the possibility, okay, I'm not saying this is true, but it's an idea that Afton himself is actually the one who got bit, which could have caused him to go even more berserk after the missing children's incident. Since, cause you know, his frontal lobe was removed, he would no longer feel fear, as described by Mapet in his FNAF 4's wrong theory. I mean, that theory was wrong for the outcome, but not for the science, so maybe Matt was onto something. In the 10, Phone Guy. While in the end, the phone guy wasn't the killer, he still isn't very helpful in the long run considering how he says we aren't really gonna get killed. Well, okay, look, he warns us to be careful, but he doesn't really say, oh yeah, you'll die. I don't like him, okay? He should have done more than just say, be careful, This it's trial and error, which is in essence what he said. Because honestly, after surviving this job for so long, you'd think that whoever this phone guy is would have some goddamn tips on how not to die, but he just gives us the freaking company history. Bro, I don't care if one of the animatronics 
animatronics bit someone, okay? They're trying to actually kill me. What do I do? Like, someone's head got bit five years ago, okay? I don't care. They're trying to eat my brain, okay? My Prada's at the cleaners, along with my hoodie and my animatronic flip-flops, you pretentious phone guy, okay? Why don't you ki come and keep this job so that I don't have to put my life at risk, huh? I don't care if you're dead. Come on, you stupid mother- And at nine, Michael Afton. Now, while Michael Afton is seen as the hero of the story, trying to shut down William's criminal spree despite being his child and whatnot, in my eyes, Michael is also a villain because this kid is the reason there is a FNAF story to begin with, okay? Look, if this kid kid had just offed himself or ended up dying like his siblings, nobody would have been around to tell the story of the Aftons. We don't even know if Henry would have been trying to stop William without Michael bringing attention to it, okay? And considering how this channel has made over 400 FNAF videos at this current moment, those are all because Michael Afton just had to keep on kicking instead of kicking the bucket. We've made over 400 FNAF videos total, but in rough estimates, currently I've hosted around 300 of those, which is actually insane and honestly scary as hell. And all of this because Michael just had to chase dear old dad and try to ruin him. If you put that effort into becoming like the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment once your father disappeared, maybe you could have done more good, okay? Afton would have been stuck in Fazbear Frights' room forever, and you could have stopped the company at its roots, and then turned it into something maybe more productive. And it ain't Glamrock Ready. This is another character that is intended to be a friendly one, but ends up doing more harm than good. The existence of Glamrock Freddy in Security Breach is a good thing. He serves as your protector, and is the first really friendly animatronic in the games, but he makes himself a villain in my eyes just by being stupid. He could have just left Gregory in his stomach cavity and then gone about the night and kept him safe until it was 6am, but instead he makes me go through this whole damn pointless goose chase just for the doors to reopen at 6am again. Why couldn't I have just chilled in his green room, okay? The curtains were closed, Vanessa and Vanny didn't know where I was. Realistically, I should have just stayed in there until 6am, and then I could have made a break for the doors. I didn't get out any faster by doing this, like Freddy said I would. Like, for game purposes, you have to go through this in order for time to progress, but if I j had just chilled in Freddy's green room, technically, I could have waited until 6 and I'd be fine. Like, that that's what should have happened. And since it didn't, Glamrock Freddy is a villain. And at 7, Fazbear Entertainment. I think arguably the biggest villain in the entirety of FNAF isn't even William, but rather Fazbear Entertainment. If we want to go, like, cause and effect, yes, William created Fazbear Entertainment. However, this company has gone on to do plenty of messed up things without him. Fazbear's Right. Reopening however many times they have, even though people are constantly killed at their locations. I'm sure plenty of other corporate crime as well, like espionage and fraud. Oh, and the entirety of FNAF AR, since they're intentionally sending out animatronics that they know are messed up to families all over the world. One of the higher ups of the company is still working for Afton, as we learn from Security Breach's lore baskets, since someone very influential at the company recommended Vanessa for security guard, despite her having no prior experience. And I mean, come on, someone had to pull the strings to build on where the FNAF 6 pizzeria was. So, in my eyes, the biggest villain is Fazbear Entertainment in general. However, this isn't a biggest villains list, it's the scariest villains list, so they're only number 7. And at 6, Scott Cawthon. Now, I could say that Scott Cawthon is the villain because he made the series and continued it after he originally intended to end it, and thus caused me to have to talk about these theories for 8 hours a day, at least 5 days a week. However, this can get even more meta than that. I could say that Scott Cawthon in-universe made FNAF games which also helped to contribute to Fazbear Entertainment coming back and reopening yet again with the Pizzaplex. But again, I can get even more meta than that, believe it or not, because way deep in the infamous FNAF world game, Scott Cawthon is the final boss, or at least his avatar is. And you know what? I think that deserves number four. Anim Dude, otherwise known as Scott Cawthon, the storyteller or Omega Scott in the game files, or the Puppet Master by 8-Bit Fredbear, is the main antagonist and final boss of FNAF world. He can only be fought in hard mode mode after beating security and entering the tent afterwards. His appearance is a three-dimensional representation of Scott Cawthon's icon avatar, which originally came from one of his previous games called There Is No Pause Button. But either way, he was the main antagonist of FNAF World, so it counts. How about you in at number five, The Blob. The Blob is a massive-sized proportion of wire tentacles and animatronic parts with possession of many glowing red eyes, because of course it does. The Blob's main head has a mask identical to that of Funtime Freddy in instead of Molten Freddy, with black eyes and pinkish red glowing pupils, and the endo face reveals to have metal plates rather than wire tubes as well, which is also confusing. Their body has a large black mass made of tentacle wires, and it appears to be a larger version of Molten Freddy after the pizzeria simulator fire, but again, it's Funtime Freddy's face, which doesn't make sense. It's all 
also far more grotesque and mixed with parts of other animatronics and endoskeletons. If you look closely, you can see older animatronics like Circus Baby, Puppet, Chica, Mangle, Bonnie, several Endo Mark IIs, and probably many others on the actual like inside. However, this dude thing is creepy as all living hell. And while they haven't done much since they haven't been in the series much, I still don't like them. Currently, all they've really done is either kill Gregory or potentially save William. Some people like to believe that the blob killed William, but I'm only going to be certain that he's dead when he dies on screen. So the blob pulling Afton away from a fire that he could have just lapped him at and let the bastard burn makes them a villain in my eyes. Also, we know that they're meant to be evil. It just looks like a giant black Freddy flubber booger. And a force entered. While certainly creepy as a m Ennard isn't all that scary in my opinion. He's certainly scary looking, but as a villain, all Ennard wants to do is escape. And once they do, and your flesh suit draws too much attention, they bail. Their only crime really is hijacking your body without your consent. But other than that, they don't really seem to do anything major. Baby ends up separating from them before they do anything crazy. And after sister location, the next time we see them is in Pizzeria Simulator. And between those two games, they seemingly don't have any kills under their belt. Why they wanted to escape only to later not do anything is one question. But in reality, since they don't do anything, we're really safe around them. Well, until they start trying to kill us in Pizzeria Simulator, but honestly, they didn't want us dead in Sister Location, so I think that they're pretty chill. However, there is the possibility of them being filled with the remnant of the original Missing Children animatronics, but that's in the novels, so there's no way of proving that this is truly the case with the games. Getting close to the end in number three, Charlotte. Charlotte Emily, otherwise known as Charlie, is the main protagonist of the novels Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes and The Twisted Ones, and the secondary protagonist of The Fourth Claw. In The Silver Eyes, Charlotte is described to be a teenage girl with a round face and rosy cheeks, with brown wide eyes that glisten, and frizzy light brown hair. She wears a white t-shirt, black jeans, combat boots, and denim jacket, and it always looks like she's about to smile, somehow. And despite her sweetness and kind personality, she likes to be independent, and she doesn't actually get captured by William, but it's a long story, okay? In the books, she's actually the one who kinda killed William in the spring bonnie suit, even though I guess now we know that he didn't actually die in that suit, but she also finds it hard to trust people. However, what makes her a villain isn't her trust issues, it's actually because unbeknownst to her, she is an animatronic robot that was meant to replace the daughter that Henry had lost. But it's also revealed that the animatronic is also the baby animatronic that we know and love, who can switch between her forms at will. And the human version of the animatronic doesn't remember being baby. This human animatronic also looks a lot like an actual human, it can even bleed. So yeah, Charlotte in the books is also baby. That's pretty damn freaky. And ultimately, in a number two, Gregory. Gregory is a villain and a criminal mastermind no matter what you people tell me in the comments. You can justify it all you want. He's still committed multiple crimes against Utah and its people, including murder, if you go by the phaser blast ending where Gregory orders robots to disassemble Vanny, like I explained in a previous video. Link to the Is Gregory a Criminal video in the iCard, whatever side it's on. But seriously, the crimes this guy commits within only what we see in the game is insane. Stealing, trespassing, destruction of property, grand larceny for stealing Freddy, and like I said, if you pick the phaser blast ending, Gregory kills Vanny. And it's not like he could claim self-defense, given that he actually chose to confront her instead of leaving, which can confirm premeditation, frankly. And he uses way too much force to justify self-defense. Whether you like it or not, Gregory is a criminal and a villain and deserves to be in prison. No way around that. And people are justifying this, okay? And the people who do, you, you need some form of therapy, just like Gregory and Vanessa were getting. Just like, come on, think about it. Gregory is a horrible person, and he could have just chilled with Freddy and been fine, but he went out of his way to destroy the animatronics, even paraphrasing the Joker when talking about them, omitting the swear word for you get what you f deserve. Finally, in at number one, Baby. Originally known as Elizabeth Afton when she was alive, Circus Baby is the primary antagonist of Five Nights at Freddy's sister location. The soul of William Afton's daughter resides within her, alongside Baby's own consciousness. In FNAF 5, she removes her endoskeleton from her costume, and her fellow animatronics end up combining to create Ennard. So, she's already been on this list in the form of Ennard, and not only that, but she's also the reason Ennard was seemingly so brutal. Plus, she was also on this list because of Charlotte. However, 
server that's the books. In the games, she pretends to be our friend the whole time in Sister Location, keeping us alive so that we would trust her, only to get tricked into going to the scooping room, where she could then forcefully enter our body and escape. Like top 10 anime betrayals and babies at the top of this list. It's like she pretended to be our friend for the whole season of the show, but in the second last episode she's revealed to be the villain. Not to mention the various versions that she has in FNAF AR, like Broiler and Heartsick Baby? No thank you sir. And those goddamn plush babies are just as bad. And they're goddamn plushies. Baby is the scariest FNAF villain that isn't Afton, and that's why she's tops this list. And at 10, Brian Wells. This is certainly an interesting case that you may not really think relates to William, but let me explain my thought process. Brian Douglas Wells was an American pizza delivery driver who was killed during a complex bank robbery plot. The plot involved a collar bomb, a scavenger hunt, the robbery itself, and a pizza delivery man. Following an attempt to rob PNC Bank, Wells was surrounded by police. That's when the bomb around his neck ended up detonating, killing him. And while his family denies that he was a part of it, investigators and a federal prosecutor concluded that Wells was a knowing participant in the bank robbery. However, he was told that the bomb was fake and he did not know that his co-conspirators intended for him to die. Now, I think that it was probably detonated because he got caught and they didn't want him to rat on them and that is the prevailing theory amongst these people as well. Against amongst the prosecutor and whatnot, but aside from being a pizza delivery man for Mamma Mia's Pizzeria, what possible connection could he have to Afton? Well, being killed by a device that was supposed to be safe, for one, the spring locking and the collar, being betrayed by your peers, in William's case most likely Henry, and the affinity for complex plans. I feel like this may have been at least a slight source of inspiration, especially since this came up when I searched for pizza place serial killers, um, because I was hoping that there would be one. Um, uh, that's weird to say. Um, <laughs> let's just... Let's just move on. In at 9, Andrew Cunanan. Andrew Cunanan was born in San Diego, California and eventually settled in San Francisco's Castro District and socialized with older, wealthy gay men while indulging heavily in illicit substances. It's unclear what set him off, but he began a cross-country killing spree of five unknown victims, the last of which was actually fashion designer Gianni Versace. Cunanan killed himself on a Miami boathouse in 1997, and if that didn't set off an alarm, uh, congratulations, you have not been ruined by FNAF yet. However, William Afton also had five victims at least, but definitely only had five when FNAF 1 and even around FNAF 2 was released. And while FNAF 1 does take place in 1993, many have theorized it to instead take place in 1997, which is unlikely given the minimum wage of the times and the connection to another real person, but nonetheless, it's certainly an interesting case of more possible dates lining up and the same number of victims. You know, a lot of people on this list are actually going to have five victims, and it's extremely creepy. And at 8, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, who was the manager of this Chuck E. Cheese, was tallying receipts in the back room. While she was doing that, Bobby Stevens was scrubbing down the kitchen, and Ben Grant, Colleen O'Connor, and Sylvia Crawwell were all working in the main party area. However, there was someone hiding in the bathroom, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap, who earlier that year had begun working as a cook, but was fired after an argument over his hours. But this time, he was looking for revenge. He exited the bathroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen, then he went into the kitchen where he shot Bobby, although Bobby ended up surviving and was actually a key witness in his case. Then Nathan went to the back room, where Margaret opened the safe before being shot twice. Nathan filled her bag with $1,500 cash, arcade tokens, and keychains, but thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. Thanks to MatPat and his first game theory on FNAF, this one is fairly well known, hence why it's closer to the top, but if I didn't include it, I feel like everyone in the comments would have asked me why, so there you go. And it's seven Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were 16 serial killings committed over a period of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The two men who committed these killings, last names Burke and Hare, were doing it because they also sold the corpses to Robert Knox for dissection at his anatomy lectures. There was actually a shortage of corpses in 
Edinburgh, and thus people actually started grave robbing and selling the corpses rather than selling the possessions. Since a loophole in the system only considered it a theft if the body was taken with its clothes. Naked corpses were fine to take though, apparently. They didn't really think that one through. These two were killing in the name of science, something that we suspect William was doing as well. However, they actually were in a messed up way contributing to the furthering of science, whereas William is only doing it for his own selfish reasons reasons and to become immortal. After Hare was given immunity to confess to the murders so that they could convict Burke, Burke was sentenced to death. Shortly afterwards, his corpse was dissected and his skeleton was displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2021, it actually still remains. Oh, and by the way, the reason they're known as Burke and Hare was because both of their first names are William. Yeah. So maybe Afton's wife is named something similar. And it's six, Ted Bundy. During an interview with Daco, PJ Haywood, the voice actor for William Afton in Sister Location, FNAF AR, and Ultimate Custom Night, said that Scott Cawthon described William as being a charismatic, smooth-talking snake oil salesman, which coincides with book William being able to convince anyone of anything. This is actually very similar to how Ted Bundy had been described. Bundy was regarded as charismatic and handsome, traits that he exploited to win the trust of both his victims and society as a whole. He would typically approach his victims in public places, either feigning a physical impairment such as an injury or impersonating an authority figure before bludgeoning them until they were unconscious. While he did operate nearly a decade before Afton started his spree, those are merely just like year numbers. But one of the most interesting facts, however, is that in 1975, Bundy was arrested and jailed in Utah for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault in Utah, where the games and the crimes of Afton take place. Halfway through in number five, Arthur Gary Bishop. Arthur Gary Bishop was an American serial killer in 1983, and as a result of a routine police investigation, he confessed to the murders of five young boys between 1979 and 1983. Bishop was born in Hinckley, Utah, and was the eldest of six brothers. Bishop was raised as a devout Latter-day Saint, Mormon, and was an Eagle Scout and an honor student, which is already suspicious in comparison to Afton, given that Afton was also regarded as intelligent given his talent for animatronics, especially in the 80s, and his passion for business. But not only that, Bishop also operated under an alias. Bishop was arrested for embezzlement in February of 1978 and given a five-year suspended sentence, but he skipped his parole and fled to Salt Lake City, living under the alias of Roger Downs. Under this alias, Bishop would then kill five boys between 1979 and 1983. It's also interesting that multiple key dates in Bishop life line up closely to releases of FNAF games. On July 14th, 1993, he was arrested, and FNAF 4 came out on July 23rd, nine days after that. Well, not in the same year, but you know what I mean. Bishop's first kill was on October 14th, 1979, and Sister Location was released on October 7th. I mean, it's not concrete, but it's certainly interesting. Plus, also, he was caught in 1983, the same year that Crying Child was bit. In it for Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy who claimed to kill for the benefit of the victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at the Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide which he had kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each one of his victims, including how he killed them. That gives me just that, that's intense William Afton vibes. Like, not not for some certain reasons, but the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the benefit of the victims or just for any benefit uh, is still, is, it's horrifying, okay? It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having. And a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, he's not exactly like this from my memory, but the game version certainly seems to be the type, okay? Especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. Getting close to the end in number three, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five men, again, with the five. Directed by voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link the killings to Dillon until he actually sent a letter to a local paper. After the FBI 
FBI put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dylan's actually brought into the attention of the authorities, which in my mind is very close to the story of William Afton. The amount of victims, the authorities only investigating those murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, the delusions or the voices in his head could be him being possessed. But honestly, a whole load of these people are just so much like William, it's terrifying. And ultimately in at number two, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy, as I'm sure you know, was an American serial killer who killed 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospitals and charitable events as Pogo or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public services as a clown prior to the discovery of these crimes, but jeez. Gacy committed all of the crimes inside of his ranch house, which is a horrible idea, just like William killing inside of his own pizzeria. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and really makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Okay, killing in a place related to you, for Gacy it was his ranch house, and for Afton it's his business. The target demographic is also the same with young people, although Afton also killed girls, um, which I don't, I don't even want. Ugh. And while you may think that this is a stretch, uh, even FNAF itself made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. Um, intentional or not, that, come on, that's, that's a, that's a connection. And finally, in at number one, Robert Berdella. Robert Berdella is, to me, the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own his own business called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human skulls, but he also seemingly started his killing spree in 1984. The MO is certainly not the same. Uh, Berdella would drug and kidnap men that he met in bars and on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant scene is carried over to William. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, hence this list, but there are certain a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine like all the serial killers we talked about on this list, especially these last four, you'll basically get a real William Afton, and I don't like that, okay? That's horrifying. But again, that was the point of this list, so it was a way from, for me to talk about FNAF without having to talk about FNAF, okay? I didn't go into too much detail with these because, well, I, I'm sure you can guess why, um, but yeah. Either way, I think that this is a, a pretty... The, the, the similarities are scary, that's all I have to say. In at 10, Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy, who claimed to kill for the benefit of their victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he had also confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide, which he kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each of his victims, including how he killed them. This gives me intense William Afton vibes, okay? Not for some certain reasons, but for the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the victim's benefit, but still doing it in horrifying ways. It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having, and a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, I don't think he's like this exactly, but his game version certainly seems the type, especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. And a 9 Raincoat Killer. Hailing from the Deadly Premonition universe, this video game villain is the launching point for the game's story. The murder of Anna Graham sparked renewed interest in the legend of the Raincoat Killer. After the arrival of FBI agent Francis York Morgan, Harry began to keep a close eye on the case, intervening at seemingly random moments. He uses his aide, Michael Tolletson, to convey messages to York, telling him to take it slow and to keep his mind open to all possibilities. As York tried to solve the case, the new killer showed up many times. As more evidence surfaced, it became clear that George Woodman was the new raincoat killer. He had sacrificed the woman of Greenvale in order to become a mortal. Unfortunately for him, York was able to defeat him, ending the terror of the raincoat killer. Much like how, in the novels at least, William is searching for immortality thanks to the discovery of Remnant, and then is defeated by the Springtrap suit and Henry's multiple fires. Okay, well he would have been defeated if he wasn't possessed by his son, but I mean, like, there's still a parallel there. Right? And it ate the Ice Cream Man. Suggested to me by Amanda, the Ice Cream Man comic series is a horror anthology of loosely connected stories that all share the common link of a mysterious Ice Cream Man named Rick, who's also revealed to be Ricardus. 
who, while a seemingly ordinary ice cream man, possesses inexplicable powers which he uses upon unsuspecting people. Rick's nemesis Caleb, a man dressed in an all black cowboy outfit, will sporadically appear in the series trying to thwart Rick's plans, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully. Honestly, this kind of story is very reminiscent of William Afton and Henry's story, uh, Afton being the ice cream man, which is ironic given what happened to Elizabeth, and Henry is Caleb trying to thwart William's plans, sometimes successful and sometimes not. But no matter what, William always comes back, just like the Ice Cream Man. And Ice Cream Man is very close to how I feel William acts with his victims. Like he's all like warm and fuzzy and then he just shoves you in the back of his freezing cold van and drives off. In at 7, Norman Osborn. Another suggestion from Amanda that I'm surprised I didn't think of first. Um, Norman Osborn being the Green Goblin, but also the CEO of a very successful company, it seems like these two share a lot of the same ideas, or I guess rather the same concepts. Business owner who by night is evil and wreaks havoc without anyone really knowing it. But despite their secrecy, eventually people catch on and find out their secrets. Superpowers in the form of a goblin serum or being possessed by your dead son. So the two characters at the fundamental level are actually very much alike. The specifics aren't, which is really what threw me off, but it's a part of why we wanted Willem Dafoe to play Afton in the FNAF movie, right? Because he played this kind of character before with Norman. Plus, Norman and Afton kind of sound the same, just a little bit though. Osborne and William don't, but William and Willem do, so who knows at this point? And at six, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five people. Directed by the voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link them to Dillon until he had sent a letter to the local paper. After the FBI put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dillon's brought him to the attention of the authorities, which in my mind at least is nearly identical to the story of William Afton. The amount of the first victims, the authorities only investigating the murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, and eventually you'll see that there are quite a few similarities to multiple real people, and it's scary. At least when people compare me to Afton, it's because I wear purple. Halfway through into number 5, Elliot Ludwig. Elliot Ludwig is a recurring character in Poppy Playtime. He is most known for his position as both the founder and overseer of Playtime Co. Elliot Ludwig is an old man with light skin, blackish hair, and an unknown eye color, probably brown, given that it, I think it's the most common eye color. He is seen wearing a suit during the first VHS tape in the beginning of Chapter 1, A Tight Squeeze, which seems to be an old Playtime Co. commercial for Poppy herself and for the factory tours that were once held there, where in this video he is engulfed in purple Light, which is certainly an interesting moment, one that I even pointed out in our Poppy Playtime playthrough video. Not to mention the whole he puts people in toys thing, like how William put people in animatronics, plus Elliot probably put his daughter into Poppy, much like how Afton's daughter Elizabeth ended up becoming Circus Baby, and then Elliot sealed his daughter away, and Afton put Baby in Circus Baby's entertainment and rental, which we visit in sister locations. So, yeah, like this. And at four, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy was an American serial killer who killed at least 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospital and charitable events as Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public service as a clown prior to the discovery of his crimes. Gacy committed all of his murders inside of his ranch house. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs with the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Killing in a place that's related to you, for instance, Gacy, it was his home, and for Afton, it's his business. The target demographic was also the same with young people, although Afton is a bit more diverse and killed girls as well. And while you may think that this is a stretch, even FNAF made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. I mean, come on. Dude, that, if that's not a giveaway, I don't know what is. Getting close to the end, into number three, Joey Drew Studios. Joey Drew Studios, from the Bendy and the Ink Machine series, also known as The Workshop and The Old Workshop, is an American corporation and animation studio established in 1929. This is where he and his friend Henry Stein, along with all the other workers, collaborated for 30 years before the studio's downfall, producing a series of Bendy cartoons. In 1946, Joey Drew Studios was under investigation after reports of hazardous work environments, missing employees, harassment, and excessive back pay, as well as the company's danger of being bankrupt. 
all of which are the result of Joey's mismanagement of the studio. Anonymous employees threatened to make labor unions over the poor conditions, which included unpermitted buildings, hazardous electrical wiring, and a plumbing system prone to bursting, which sounds exactly like the working conditions that would be in some form of Fazbear establishment. Plus, there's a machine that takes human souls and turns them into ink monsters, like how the animatronics get infused with the souls of the missing children. I feel like that connection was kind of expected on the list. But ultimately, in at number two, Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is a fictional character created by novelist Thomas Harris. Lecter is a serial killer who eats his victims. Before his capture, he was actually a respected forensic psychiatrist, and after his incarceration, he is consulted by FBI agents Will Graham and Clarice Starling to help them find other serial killers. His most iconic appearance being in Silence of the Lambs and the often misquoted line of Hello Clarice, have the lambs stopped screaming. And while you may not be able to find any similarities between Afton and Lecter, this one is actually confirmed as inspiration at least for his voice. According to his voice actor PJ Haywood, in Sister Location, Afton's voice is inspired by Hannibal Lecter, in a way that he's unnervingly calm even when he's about to kill someone, which is supported by some of his novel counterparts quotes. So yes, while it's not directly inspiring Afton, it inspired his voice. And finally, in number one, Robert Burdella. Robert Burdella is to me the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own a business called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human and skulls, he also seemingly started killing in 1984. The MO is certainly not the exact same, Berdella would drug and kidnap men that he met at bars or on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant is carried over to William Afton. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, but there are certainly a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine the four real serial killers I put on this list, Harvey, Dylan, Gacy, and Berdella, you would end up getting basically a real William Afton. I didn't go into much detail with these because, well, YouTube might get mad at that, especially when I'm comparing them to a fictional serial killer from a video game series, but who knows? Either way, I think it's a pretty solid combo of four killers, and that's kind of freaky.